武家の棟梁将軍なのじゃ And then ask yourself what kind of man wields power in a land like this Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're discussing Shogun Episode 1. If you have not started watching this series, please do. It is an engaging tale about feudal Japanese life being witnessed by the first Englishman. The great unifier of Japan passed away, leaving an heir too young to lead. The recently unified leaders must choose between honoring their former master or expanding upon their own fiefdom. It is based on historical yet dramatized events. I have watched the first four episodes, so please note I will be exposed to more information than the episode I'm currently reviewing. I will not spoil anything outside of the episode that I'm reviewing but I will point out moments where the writing was truly doing more than what it was on the surface. I have watched the first episodes thrice and not read the book on which everything is based off of. We will be theory crafting, reviewing, and overall just talking about how awesome this show is, is overall. But without further ado, let's overthink an epic show about feudal Japanese life. The episode begins with a rotting ship, set adrift in calm waters and destroyed by fighting or a harsh sea. The guns, in better condition than the men who would waste what little energy they had to fire them. We learn that the year is 1600. Japan is undiscovered by the rest of the European world, only known by Portugal and the Catholics that spread Jesus Christ capitalism. European Protestants are the sworn enemies, and in Ahsoka, like I talked about before, the Great Unifier has died, leaving five powerful men to battle for what comes next. On the ship, we meet the European Protestants' pilot, or Anjin, essentially their navigator. His name is John Blackthorne, and he pulls up white sand from the sea floor, marking their closeness to the rumored island. He reports his findings to the captain, whose disheveled look mirrors his men and his mind that has been pulled to suicide. They have no food, no water, no ability to escape their predicament. He disregards the hope that John brings and insists that death is but a cool breeze, and he longs for that fresh air. Their voyage started with five ships and more than 500 men. A dozen remain, following a pilot's journal that they found on a defeated Portuguese ship. They hoped that it would bring them to this new island, but nobody knew for certain. John leaves his gun to the defeated captain before dismissing himself. It sets a brutal tone for this world, and the gunshot, moments later, rests upon John's ears like a vulture, waiting to feast. Suicide in this period does not carry the same dogma that it has now. Something that we learn in this first episode and many times after is that choosing your own death has merit, and that merit is worth considering. That Death isn't something to fear, but part of this grand life that we experience. In fact, now that I'm writing this, I have to wonder why this theme is being so heavily established with our main character. Perhaps this series starts with a suicide of a higher, once honored captain because John will eventually have to choose how he dies. Can you feel it? That is the breath of the Almighty. He's calling us. Listen. We then see a Catholic Japanese man praying by the water and discovering the foreign vessel. He calls the authorities, which introduces Umi, nephew of Yabushiki. Also, throughout this video, uh, throughout this series, there's a lot of names and words and everything that I'm just not exposed to often, um, right? It's just atypical to my culture. Um, you know, I'm seeing words that uh, essentially I've never seen that combination of letters and sounds before. Um, so please allow me a little bit of leeway as I am learning how to say a lot of these things. And uh, if I do mess something up, please just correct me in the comments. Like, it, you're not going to offend me. Um, I'm learning, but I just want to add that little disclaimer in case there's like a million people upset at how I just said um, Yabushigi, because um, that may not be it, right? Like I'll go back and I'll listen to the video and then like mentally, I just have to say it like 30 times. It's like a Kichita all over again in Westworld, if anyone remembers that. But all right. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the video. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. All right, bye. They sneak into the starving men's sleeping quarters and subdue the only man with any fight left, John Blackthorne. We're introduced to Nagakado, son of Torinaga, and then Torinaga himself. The fact that we are introduced to the children, or the offspring or lineage, next generation, of these great men uh, that would be fighting for this power before the great men themselves 
kind of highlights this story spanning across the generations. Family matters here, and in many ways, it's the reason that they fight it all. It's about legacy. The first time we meet Torinaga, he is giving a life lesson to his son, talking about hiding in the sun like the clever falcon before it swoops in for a kill. It's about operating in clear view. It's about real Gs moving in silence like lasagna. I'm sure that Torinaga himself is hoping that his son is truly hearing the double meaning behind the words about the mighty falcon. They march onto Asaka Castle, where Lord Ishido resides and waits to imprison the expecting regent of the former Taiko. Now, these people are peers, so everything that happens here is a big political bureaucratic game, waiting for the other to make the first infraction that they could use to justify their negative reaction. It's tense, and Lord Ishido stands atop his castle wall looking at his soon-to-be-defeated prey, not knowing that he probably won't be the falcon of this allegory. We have this line about wise men knowing when their time is up. It could be building for that reveal with John Blackthorne, or revealing that Lord Ishido is not a wise man, because truly he does not realize that his time is up in the story. Lord Toranaga accepts, riding inside of the honorable stronghold and being adjusted by the servants that would make sure he looks the part that he must. This sets the stage for life here, for the culture, for the power dynamic, because he stands atop a dozen servants who will never be named, and we can only hope that they are being treated better than we think powerful men would treat the help in the 1600s. It seems like he does, but we can also see these positions could be worse than what we're seeing. Truly, the role of women in this show highlights just how wild a true patriarchy can be, and gives me hope that at least we can smile and say that women are peers before we remove their rights in the 21st century. But this dialogue about this place being a real shithole, I love this, because it sets a great tone for how his men are allowed to speak to him privately, and also breaks some of the dogma that I think that we probably have when we consider what conversations looked like in this former culture. It's telling the audience that we're not about to watch a show about being proper. We're about to watch a show about acting proper. They gather at the meeting area, all of their men waiting outside, the open doors meant to say that all can hear what the Council of Regents discuss. We are open. Information is for all, and knowing full well that this is purely a show. Lord Ishido brings up Torinaga amassing power after the great Taiko's death bringing up several marriages that he has consented to. They say that they believe this power will align against the council, though they do not mention why they believe that. Toranaga humbly bows to the council, a gesture that this show has really helped me understand more. It can mean so much, but here it's showing that his pride is not in control. He is listening and not trying to defend himself, but assure that his loyalty remains to the former Tycho's wishes, and he bows before his peers to show that he views them as such. It is not a matter of pride that is standing before, you know, his service. They accuse him of taking a hostage to assure his safety, but he politely asserts that she is in no more danger there than he is amongst his peers. He brings up the great Taiko being happy that they are not all getting along in this confused Lord Ishido and myself at first, but I think it's because he truly does not want the power over Japan. He wants to do what his former leader requested and keep his son safe until he can continue their great legacy not create more government, policy, and bureaucracy as his stand-in. He says that the meetings are exhausting and the other regions stiffen up. Undoubtedly, they are accustomed to these meetings. They have been plotting and want complete power. Toranaga being a thorn to these men means that they are less likely to unify and find reasons to take the mantle from the boy who is still too young to lead. The great Taiko would be happy that they aren't all getting along because it means that they aren't all trying to steal his child's power with endless slogs of meetings. Again, this is a great tongue-in-cheek moment. Everything has depth. Great job to the writers throughout throughout this entire scene. Love this. Behind Toranaga, one of his men rages at the subtle insults and implications, fighting the impulse to lash out until Lord Ishido makes their intentions clear. The council demands the ladies return, and afterward they would vote on if Toranaga's involvement should be considered for the council. They have all signed this affidavit of sorts, and this poor misguided man steps into the arena, 
demands that his lord has been nothing but a servant of the great Tycho, and then insinuates the council had insulted Toronaga, which is a perfect way to demonstrate the backwards nature of, this, of these dealings, because it's all about the honorable exchange. It's not the insults that were wrong or the accusations. It is acknowledging that their words were insulting, and more than just a peaceful discussion between the council. You cannot be offended. You cannot let your pride get the better of you. And this man does. He backs down and offers to commit seppuku and end his family line. This is another one of those practices that anybody today would probably have a hard time comprehending. So please keep in mind that this is a topic that I'm not well versed in from a culture that I've only been exposed to through media that others may have a different take on. But from what I understand, it is all about honor. He insults his lord, brought shame to himself and his family so for speaking out of term, for insinuating that an insult was an insult, he offered an apology. Seemingly, the only apology worth a damn is ending your life to show how sincere you are about your service. It is brutal. It is barbaric. And quite honestly, so at odds with our current understanding of suicide, it's hard to imagine a culture could ever evolve to include this as a way of making things right. But it did. And truly, that is the most fascinating thing. This practice in the real world, how did this happen, right? Like I could watch, I, I someone send me a video of how like this started in the culture, right? I want to watch six hours of that, someone talking about that. But regardless, Toranaga does not want this man to die, but what's done is done. Ultimately, I think the decision is left to Ishido, who could have pardoned him, I think, but he didn't. Instead, he said that his outburst was typical for his unruly clan, another insult that must be treated as though it weren't to avoid war. Back in his private quarters, he and Hiro Matsu discuss this death being pointless, and Toranaga promises to save Fuji's life. This is the granddaughter of Hiro Matsu, and is married to the outspoken warrior. The only reason they don't go to war directly is because they would be fighting four versus one, and they would surely lose. The Falcon letter reveals a barbarian ship, and Toranaga tells Hiromatsu to investigate. It seems kind of random, and I must imagine, based off of you know some of the complete context that we have now, that this letter noted alongside the ship that this you know this barbarian had this odd Christian, um, but also anti-Portuguese existence, and. You know, I want to theorycraft why, but I also don't want to spoil anything else. So let's save that for uh, for later videos. We come to the broken ship being towed, Omi getting things ready for his uh, uncle, and the man here praying. It's clear that he does not like Yabushigi or fears what will happen uh, for what he believes the you know are these people that are Christians that are about to be locked away. Uh, this brings us to John, locked away with his men, looking dirty as they possibly could be. They briefly talk about what to do, where they are, and the honorable things that John has done for these men as their pilot. They decide to pretend that they are merchants, and their true intentions implied, but never explicitly said until later. John is confident that this is not where he dies, which, of course, he fully believes. Then we see Fuji. Finding out the news about her husband and the child that is soon to be executed, she threatens to take her own life, and the showrunners found the cutest, fattest baby in existence to really drive home how ignorant it is to the dangers of this world. Fuji holds a dagger to her throat, knowing she couldn't live a life without her child, and were introduced to Mariko. She calms the woman, convincing her that she must continue to serve because her lord demands it. Fuji eventually gives the child to his father, and Mariko battles with the emotion of performing such a task. This was another scene meant to highlight the brutal nature of this world, and the emotions felt after acting is complete. This is how powerful these men truly are. Toranaga stopping her from taking her own life, not because it's good to keep living, but because he has more for her to do in service to his cause. But her asking God for forgiveness also introduces this subtle drama with Japanese Christianity juxtaposing traditional Japanese beliefs. This is a recurring theme throughout the series, and maybe why Toranaga finds himself at odds with the other regents who follow the Portuguese faith 
and Jesus Christ capitalism. We're given dialogue that highlights the brutality of Yabushigi and how much Umi wishes to honor him. We see him yelling at his prisoners and then ordering them out, but of course we have the biggest hurdle with this new English team, and that's not understanding their language. After a tense brawl to determine whose will will succumb to the others, and both sides assured that the other are savages, John Blackthorn is out of the hole. He is given some help by a Japanese Christian who speaks Portuguese. He begs the dirty Englishman to behave, but of course, this is a lesson that would need to be learned the hard way. Umi understands the rude gesture and pisses on John, his men holding him down to assure that this wasn't a fight. Again, showcasing the brutal nature of this world as we see him being brought to Yabushigi Another Christian disregards the orders of his lord, wanting to issue last rites instead of moving out of the way. The man, clearly loyal to God more than the ruler of this town, loses his head, and the troop marches on. We finally meet the infamous ruler, this powerful Yabushigi, and the Portuguese translator that will speak on behalf of John. The conflict is already so layered, and seeing this holy man falsely accused John, sets the standard for how the Portuguese live and influence here. Yabushigi sees through the holy man's oversimplification of who John is and what he is saying or represents, and John does a good job of establishing them that they are enemies by grabbing the cross and stomping it into the dirt. He also realizes that the native Japanese do not know about England at all. Portugal has kept secrets from them to assure the the trade remains in their control, and the most, you know, that's their priority. It's a higher priority than even faith. John earns Yabushigi's ear for at least a few days longer, offering him lodging and a warm bath. The Catholic demands a sacrifice, and this is why later the man is boiled alive in John's place. The scene is stormy, rain so dense you can almost smell it. John is filthy, dirty, covered in grime of God only knows what, and acts like the man pleading to the heavens for someone to listen. Which is why the next scene includes Tornaga and the Taiko's young heir, Yachio, basked in a divine light away from the storm and the stress. The pupil is shielded by what goes on and learns from the great Tornaga as, as a kind of father figure. Toranaga reveals that he was once a prisoner, traded as a boy between his father's enemies for many years as part of a much larger game. It's telling us that he has done the time on the bottom, so he kind of he kind of deserves this position. The hidden past is a reoccurring theme, and I'm curious if we'll actually get to see those moments that really shaped him to explain why he does some of the things that he does later on. We also meet Diano who is a Buddhist nun and wife of the late Taiko. She advises his children, though is not his mother. She is also very cunning and in some ways acts as the grounding voice for Toranaga, who learns that even the royalty, the highest people of this land, shielded from the worst that goes on, feel the creep of the other regents. Toranaga asserts that he does not want the mantle and will defend the legacy of the former Taiko with his life. It's a touching moment, almost whispered between each other to avoid unnecessary ears, assuring her that her late husband's legacy has a chance. Now that I'm truly thinking critically about this moment and this man operating in plain view and now standing in a place that is lit as if it were the sun itself, some part of me wonders if he isn't actually making the ultimate play for the throne here. Like, nobody expects him, certainly not me, and I think it would be such a shocking reveal if, if it were done correctly. But for now, I kind of just wanted to share that what if. I'm going to keep that as a thought in the back of my mind and not shape too many theories around that. But, ooh, goodness gracious, that would be that would be wild. Diane says that it's time for a shogun. And from my understanding, what she's saying here is that it's time for martial law. We need a military leader to openly lead them. And she wants this to be him because she knows where his heart is is truly at, but this isn't how he operates, and like we learn later on, there are maybe more than one heart at play here. We then come to the most brutal death of all time, and that's being boiled alive. Even Umi turns away from the extreme nature. 
John is bathed in the noise. The village hopes for peace, and Yabushigi meditates in its horror. He is curious about death in a rather menacing way. He looks for meaning in it, and finds even this most brutal suffering to not contain the depth that he seeks, which brings into play Kiku. Now, this scene is definitely too hot for YouTube, but I truly hope that all of you enjoyed it just the same. Also, if she isn't evil or some kind of traitor or spy to this lord or maybe a spy for Tornaga um, or another region is my point, um, I would be I would be shocked. Right. Like this introduction is so malicious, so so tailored, so something she is soft. She is smooth, seemingly defenseless, and ready to strike like a viper. Part of me thought I was about to see him killed in this scene, but seeing him cucked speaks to many things as well. He is powerful. He could have anything he desires. So women being assertive in his presence and doing things, doing atypical things that excites him, much like the macabre fascination with death. Then we return to John Blackthorne. He is naked, eating and drinking like a ravished sailor, and he is putting his hand through paper walls because of his ignorance. Yabushigi and Umi discuss what to do with John, and then Yabushigi demands a poem from his nephew. It was odd at first, but I mean, well, to be honest, on my first watch, I was like, well, that's, you know, that's just what people do back then, right? Um, but truly, I don't know. I think maybe the importance is to highlight the power structure. Like, he demands entertainment while also perhaps checking to see if his uncle has learned, I'm sorry, if his nephew has learned enough to create poetry, um, is a learned individual. It feels like he's checking him in, in some kind of way here. Um, they continue their discussion on the streets, fearing no ear around them because of their powerful status. Umi gets the increased fief that he was after, and then they discuss the boat in question. Openly, Yabushigi declares that he does not intend to give this boat to his lord, Torinaga, but keep it for himself after Torinaga dies so that he can compete against the Christian lords. Everything is a domino, and the pieces rest atop a steep slope waiting for the first to fall. He believes Torinaga's death will be that first domino, and to avoid the impact, he would betray his lord. Thankfully, the doorbell rings, and in walks Hiromatsu, Torinaga's general and probably most trusted comrade. He knows about the guns, the cannons, gold and silver. Again, everything is basked and cloaked in this tension, waiting for someone to actually make an accusation, and everybody just smiling and being honorable until it happens. Hiromatsu reminds him in no uncertain terms where his loyalty should remain, and Yabushigi insists that his, it was always his intention to serve. He talks with his nephew, and they believe a spy was the cause of this information leak. He is right, of course, and we see that later on. At first, I thought that it may be Kiku, um, and I think, of course, it kind of reveals explicitly who it was, it's the Catholic man here, but I really do feel like it still could be Kiku. Like the fact that we are getting that the introduction of that seductress character and then immediately this discussion of a spy, you know, at first it seems like it's setting it up. Right. But then at the end of the episode, they cut it off because they clearly show it's this this Catholic man, which is interesting because it means that they're kind of trying to separate the idea of Kiku from being a spy while also teasing it. I truly think that she could still she could still be one, but let's move on. Hiromatsu meets the wild Christian man that is unlike the others they have known. That's where Rodriguez comes into the story. He is a pilot of the Portuguese and tells the others he will take care of the young pilot. They have a nice discussion, starting with him checking John to make sure that he's a real pilot. After the check passes, the vibes are good, and seemingly this young buck has earned some kind of respect. Rodriguez gives some information about their upcoming trip to Osoka and the powerful men that they are en route to meet. On the boat, they start rowing until the whispers of turbulent seas blow past the seafaring men. They know a storm is coming. John and Rodriguez talk as peers a little, maybe more so as captor and captive, but John asserts that he is simply a merchant, which is a facade that does not hold up well, pretty much ever. Um, both men 
are after more information from the other, playing cards close to their chest until they know the information the other has. He asserts that the many cannons of the dilapidated ship are for protection of the merchant fleet, though this is only good for a, a good laugh for Rodriguez. After what was probably an hour or so of travel, the storm is in full effect. Each pilot does things differently. John's idea of steering into the swell, I believe, is the correct way to handle this, uh, so it doesn't, you know, hit your side and, and overturn you, though I truly do not know. Um, you know, I'm not, I am, I am American. I'm not, uh, like seafaring American. <laughs> um, Rodriguez cuts his bindings and reveals that he doesn't know how to swim because it's better for a sailor to die quickly at sea. And that thought is so funny to me, but it makes so much sense at the same time. Regardless, John immediately saves a man who had gone overboard completely. He then goes under the deck and saves another, throws a flotation device or something out to Rodriguez, who is in the water overboard and then successfully steers the ship to shore. He steps up here, proving his worth, and it is like, it just feels like it's going to be a tale about stepping up to the occasion, either in general or for John specifically. On the shore, he argues with Hiromatsu about going to find Rodriguez, and after Yabushigi steps in, they go to look for him. After a brief search, they stand atop sharp cliffs with hand-woven rope, the exchange between Yabushigi and Blackthorn is really interesting to me. They don't speak the same language, and since our perspective is that of the person who does speak our language, Yabushigi seeing through his goading to climb the rope paints him as much more aware than even John here. These are wise men, and the Englishman may have believed himself cunning and slick, but he is certainly not seeing as big of a picture as Yabushigi is. Of course, it works because of pride, and fails because of course it does. Yabushigi hits the rocks, and John watches as everything happens. Yabushigi slips in the rescue, and after not finding a way up, being drowned and pushed around by the swells of a harsh sea, he pulls his blade. He faces death. In the very moment that fascinates him, he looks above to see who bears witness meeting John's eye. Again, it just feels like they're leading to John observing these things, to taking his own life for a grander cause or a, a culture that he can finally fully understand. This is a learning moment, exposing Eastern beliefs to Western people, and he truly cannot grapple with that decision in that moment and many after. Luckily, for Yabushigi, his men are quick and his life is saved. Back in Osoka, we see an interaction between Toranaga and Miriko. They talk about her loyalty over the 16 years that she has been married to his general's family, and questions if her loyalty to God surpasses that. It doesn't, and she assures him that if the regents call for his impeachment, her and all of those that support him welcome death at his side. He wants her to translate as... Her father-in-law is bringing in John to meet him. At first, she wants to decline, offering that the Portuguese would do a better job, but he wants her to join this fight in a more impactful way. The rest of the scene is cloaked in mystery that I don't fully understand. He brings up her father dying 14 years ago, and that this could be a way to continue his fight. She is Catholic, but it seems like this could have additional meaning if we learn her father died fighting Portuguese or something similar. Either way, it's her duty to serve. This is a request her lord has given her, so based on the plea with Fuji, this is now her purpose. She assures him of her loyalty again, saying that she has more than one heart. Now, later in this episode, in only a few moments, we hear the story about having three hearts, and it really does seem like this also could have additional depth. She could be saying more than just, yes, I am loyal to you, which is how it comes across on the first watch. Toranaga believes the Barbarian and Miriko are linked to his fate, and this foreign pilot could change things for him. It's not at all clear why at this moment. It feels like it comes out of nowhere when it is said, but it is meant to seem wise and thought-provoking, and after the fact, it seems like it really could only relate to his anti-Portugal existence. But Mirko, also being included in the line about Toranaga's fate after talking about her dead father, like letting the audience know that this is a part of her and something to, you know, to know, 
it really makes me think her backstory relates to that and some kind of anti-Portuguese thing. But again, it's just a theory. Back on board the ship headed for Ahsoka, John and Rodriguez talk about the man about to kill himself and the honor behind choosing your own death. John questions if he will die here and calls this life madness. Rodriguez gives some insight about going with the flow of things, and in a moment of reflection, John slips about his true intentions. That's when Rodriguez reveals the stolen log that let them navigate through Magellan's Pass and the orders that his men were given, plunder any Spanish territory, reach the Japans, and then establish trade. Rodriguez pulls a gun on the man hoping to assault him, finding that his courtesy of a heads up was still not enough if it meant the Japanese would know his true intentions. John backs down, affirming that he will not die here. And then we come to Ahsoka, a beautiful portside mecca of civilization in this new world. We then see Fuji losing her son and husband, and the man who sends a message to Toranaga via bird. So again, we know who the spy is in this first episode, but it does really seem like it could be a mislead to stop us from questioning if additional spies were present, still looking at, uh, at you, Kiku, as well as pretty much anybody else. Like there's some powerful people here, there could be a lot of a lot of interesting like plays for power. And, um, you know, I think that's what it's all about. Like it truly, this feels like such a Game of Thrones plot. I love it. A voiceover of Rodriguez continues with the story of three hearts that every person has. One in your mouth for the world, one in your chest for your friends, and one is a secret heart deep inside that only you will ever know. So Mirko saying that she has more than one heart in that previous scene, could be saying, of course, the heart for my friends is more impactful than the heart that I show the world and keep in my mouth. And that heart is the heart for, you know, Christianity. But it could also be saying that I harbor things deep inside of me that only I fully know, and I will serve this heart as the world thinks I am just a Portuguese student and my friends think that I am loyal to them. And again, perhaps something deep inside is something else. The inclusion of the line about her heart specifically, and then in the same episode, a story about having three hearts, if nothing else can be deduced, is telling us that she is hiding something from us and all around her. Again, just great storytelling, great writing. I love this. The episode ends, revealing an absolutely massive city and all of our inexplicably faded characters meeting for the first time. John Blackthorne learned to put his pride away, offering a simple bow to the revered man that sits in front of him. Again, what an episode, what growth, what a great way to set the stage for this series. This is masterfully done, and it feels like HBO from a decade ago. I can't speak highly enough about the team that made this happen. There is so much that goes into it. Cinematically beautiful, dialogue, perfection, and it seems like the book is, it, it must be good as well. Like, bravo to everybody who was involved. But with that, we come to the end of the video. More Shogun breakdowns are on the way. The Fallout series is also on the way. We have a bunch of requests for Dune videos. Those are still going to happen. Uh, it's currently down on the list. Severance is still on that list as well, as Season 2 will probably eventually be coming out relatively in our lifetime. I don't know, probably this year. But overall, I am just a man with six jobs hoping to be a voice for you right now. So thank you for watching and spending your time with me, commenting, liking, and subscribing. It's the best way to show your support here. And to those that do, you have my lifelong thanks. Much love, everybody. And I cannot wait to talk to you all again soon.